Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Morris Collins. I'm a judge of the Court of Appeal, and I'm also a part-time Law Reform Commissioner. And on behalf of the Law Reform Commission, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this webinar to discuss the recent decision of the Supreme Court in Zalewski versus the Workplace Relations Commission. Um, I would especially like to welcome Judge Mary Lafoy, President of the Law Reform Commission, and my fellow commissioners, Ray Byrne and Andrea Mulligan, as well as all my judicial colleagues that may be in attendance. A large number of people have registered to attend the event, which is great. A number of people were also in contact explaining that for various reasons they couldn't attend live. And uh, in the circumstances, we've decided to record the webinar and it is being recorded now. And in due course, uh, a recording of the webinar will be made available in some form or another. Many of you will be familiar, no doubt, with the Zalewski decision. But to briefly summarize, Mr. Zalewski made a statutory claim for unfair dismissal pursuant to the Unfair Dismissals Act 1977. He also made a Payment of Wages Act claim, but the proceedings really focused on the unfair dismissals claim. Consequent on the enactment of the Workplace Relations Act 2015, a major piece of legislation intended to streamline the procedures applicable to a wide swathe of employment related claims. Uh, Mr. Zalewski's claim felt to be determined by the Workplace Relations Commission, uh, an adjudicating officer of that commission. The Workplace Relations Commission or the WRC is a, a new body established under the 2015 Act, replacing amongst others, the Employment Appeals Tribunal. Under the 2015 Act, there is a, a, an appeal from determinations of the WRC to the Labour Court. The Unfair Dismissals Act had provided for an appeal from the EAT to the Circuit Court, which operated as a full rehearing on the merits, with in fact a further appeal, again, a full appeal on the merits to the High Court pursuant to the Courts of Justice Act 1936. Under the 2015 Act, however, the only appeal from the WRC is to the Labour Court, and the only appeal from the Labour Court is an appeal on a point of law only to the High Court. A further and important feature of the statutory regime is that determinations of the WRC are, in substance, subject to almost automatic enforcement by the District Court on the ex parte application of the employee. That is in contrast to the position that obtained under the 1977 Act as enacted, which conferred enforcement functions on the circuit court, but those enforcement proceedings involved effectively a rehearing of the claim by the circuit court. The issue of enforcement features significantly in the Supreme Court's Article 34 analysis in Zalewski, as it did in the analysis of the High Court, uh, Mr. Justice Simons. <clears throat> the central issue in Zalewski was whether the adjudication of the plaintiff's unfair dismissal claim under the 2015 Act amounted to the administration of justice within the meaning of Article 34 of the Constitution, which requires justice to be administered in courts established by law by judges appointed in the manner provided for by the Constitution. And if so, whether such came within the scope of Article 37 of the Constitution, which protects from invalidity the exercise of limited functions and powers of a judicial nature in matters other than criminal matters by any person or body of persons duly authorized by law to exercise such functions and powers, even though they are not a judge or court. The Supreme Court held unanimously that the adjudicative functions of the WRC, at least in respect of unfair dismissals, involved the administration of justice within the meaning of Article 34, but also held by a bare majority that those functions came within the scope of Article 37. No less than three separate dissenting judges were given in addition to the majority judgment of the court, which was given by Mr. Justice O'Donnell. All of those judgments merit close consideration. The core structure of the 2015 Act thus survived constitutional challenge in Zalewski, 
But there was, however, a, a very significant rider. The exercise of jurisdiction captured by Article 37 is, the court emphasized, the administration of justice. It followed that the power being exercised must comply with the fundamental components of independence, impartiality, dispassionate application of the law, openness, and above all, fairness, which are understood to be the essence of the administration of justice, as it was put by Mr. Justice O'Donnell. The standard of justice administered under Article 37 cannot be lower or less demanding than the justice administered in courts under Article 34. Approached through what was described as the lens of Article 37, there was no adequate justification in the court's view for the blanket requirement that hearings before the WRC should be held in private. Equally, the absence from the 2015 Act of any power for the WRC to administer the oath and the consequent lack of capacity to punish a witness for false evidence given to it was constitutionally unjustifiable. Judges McKechnie and McMenamin agreed with those aspects of the majority's decision. On any view, Zelewski is a significant decision addressing as it does issues around the nature and scope of the judicial power, the relationship between articles 34 and 37 of the constitution, the outer bounds of the limited functions and powers of a judicial nature that bodies under other than article 34 courts may be authorized to exercise and crucially the standard of justice administered under article 37 as the implications of Zelewski are worked out in future litigation it may well be this latter point including issues around the formal independence and tenure of non-judicial decision makers, issues which are touched on in the judgments of Mr. Justice O'Donnell for the majority and uh, Mr. Justice McMenamin in dissent that will loom largest. Uh, I should perhaps disclose that I acted for the state defendants in Zelewski prior to my appointment as a judge. Um, my interest in Zelewski is now, I hope, purer and less partisan. The decision has particular relevance and importance from the Law Reform Commission's point of view. One of its current projects is the reform of non-court adjudicative bodies and appeals to courts, in respect of which I am acting as coordinating commissioner. More information is available on the commission's website regarding this project. As will be evident from its title, its scale is ambitious. A great multitude of non-court adjudicative bodies exercise a great variety of decision-making decision -making functions in this jurisdiction. The functions of some, such as the WRC itself, and there are many others, more closely resemble the functions performed by Article 34 courts than the functions of, say, a planning authority, an economic regulator, such as Comreg or the Commission for the Regulation of Utilities, or a body such as the Revenue Commissioners. Attempting to identify common elements across the range of these bodies is certainly a challenge. However, the appropriate taxonomy of those bodies takes on added urgency in light of Zelewski. If, as the Supreme Court has stated, the standard of justice administered under Article 37 cannot be lower or less demanding than the justice administered in courts under Article 34, it appears essential to identify those bodies whose functions involve the administration of justice under Article 37. Then there is a myriad of administrative appeal bodies, most of which have specific and narrow jurisdictions. In other jurisdictions such as England and Wales and in Australia, both at federal and state level, administrative appeal tribunals of general jurisdiction have been created but that has not been a feature of Irish administrative law to date. Whether such a general tribunal should be established here would certainly warrant consideration by the commission. Finally, there is the issue of appeals to the courts. Again, the picture presented is, to put it at its lowest, uh, less than coherent. In some cases, an appeal lies from administrative bodies to the district court, 
in the others to the circuit court appeals from the data protection commissioner being a notable example and in other cases the appeal is to the high court frequently the scope of statutory appeals is not specified with any precision so that the first issue on appeal is to determine the scope of the appeal and the standard of review to be applied the relationship of appeals with judicial review both in terms of timing and scope is frequently unclear. A very interesting aspect of Zulewski is the discussion in the various judgments of the issue of whether the existence of an appeal on the merits to an Article 34 court may in some circumstances be required and or sufficient to avoid a finding that an administrative tribunal is administering justice in a manner which would otherwise go beyond the permissible scope of Article 37. It's difficult indeed to argue with the views of the Chief Justice expressed in a speech to the Law Reform Commission's annual conference in November 2017, which was one of the principal drivers of the reform of non-court adjudicative bodies project. He said, in Ireland, every time there is a new form of right or obligation created, we create a new body. Sometimes there is a regulatory body and a regulatory appeal body and sometimes the legislation says you can appeal from that body to the courts on a point of law, sometimes to the court, to the circuit court, and sometimes to the high court. Sometimes you may even appeal on the merits to the circuit court. Of course, behind that, there's always the right to seek judicial review. And there are acres of case law about whether or not the internal systems in the regulatory bodies must be exhausted before seeking judicial review. However, Often a party argues that if they have done that, it would have been too late, and then it's a collateral attack on the original decision. I think we have got ourselves into a significant mess in this area. Zelewski does not and could not be expected to provide a blueprint for law reform in this area, but it does provide important signposts and further guidance will no doubt be provided by the follow-up litigation that will inevitably uh, follow. Zulewski is not the last word in Articles 34 and 37, any more than this webinar uh, purports to be the last word on Zulewski. The Commission has always been committed to engaging with the legal community and wider society in relation to its work. I hope that this will be the first of many engagements about the reform of non-court adjudicative bodies and appeals to courts project, including but by no means limited to formal consultation. Uh, the Commission would welcome submissions from whatever, so, whatever source regarding the project as it goes forward. Uh, it's past time for me now to introduce the speakers. Before I do, however, I, I want to express my heartfelt thanks to uh, the Commissioners, uh, the Commission's Director of Research, uh, Rebecca Cohn, for having had the idea to hold this webinar in the first place and then putting in place all of the practical arrangements necessary to enable it to take place. Thanks also to everyone else in the Commission who has helped with its organization. Um, David Gwynne Morgan a professor, uh, is an Emeritus Professor of Law at University College Cork, undoubtedly the leading university in Ireland. Uh, David has written extensively on Irish constitutional and administrative law and is co-author with Gerard Hogan and Paul Daly of administrative law, that well-known textbook. He has written uh, earlier uh, articles and books concerning issues of constitutional and administrative law. He has been the director of research to the Ryan Commission to inquire into child abuse. He has lectured since his retirement at universities in Africa and in Kuwait. But his greatest claim to fame is that from 1999 to 2003, he was director of research at the Law Reform Commission. Professor Gwynne Morgan will focus on the reconsideration of in Ray, in Ray Solicitors Act 1954 by the Supreme Court in Zalewski. In particular, he will consider whether the apparent reassessment in Zalewski of the significance and effect of that decision of the Supreme Court in the Solicitors Act case can be reconciled with the doctrine of precedent and how some of the practical considerations that arise following Zalewski underscore the important value of precedent in Irish law. Dr. Laura Cahalan is the second speaker. She's a 
a senior lecturer in the School of Law at the University of Limerick. She's a frequent contributor to public discussion on legal and constitutional issues and has advised the Oireachtas on law reform on a number of occasions. Her research interests lie in the areas of constitutional law, legal history, judicial politics, and comparative law. Laura has published nationally and internationally. She's the ed editor-in-chief of the Irish Judicial Studies Journal, and her monograph on the 1922 Constitution was published by Manchester University Press in 2016. She will discuss whether decisions of quasi-judicial bodies must be subject to appeal or, or whether uh, the existence of judicial review uh, may be sufficient. Undoubtedly, this is an issue that will be the subject of further debate and discussion post Zalewski, particularly in light of the differing views of the judges of the court uh, on that particular issue. Finally, Tricia Sheehy Skeffington is a practicing barrister with a broad civil practice spanning intellectual property, employment, defamation, and regulatory administrative law. She's a particular interest in administrative decision-making processes, having sat as a decision maker for a number of bodies and trained and advised others in respect of the implementation of their procedures. She established the advanced diploma in quasi-judicial decision-making in the King's Inns and her book, The Law and Craft of Quasi-Judicial Decision-Making in Ireland is due to be published in the near future. Um, post Zalewski, if a body is engaged in the administration of justice, it must demonstrate court-like independence, impartiality, openness, and fairness. Tricia will examine which bodies can be considered to be engaged in Article 37 type uh, administration of justice and what the implications of Zalewski are, are for those bodies. Now, while the speakers are speaking, you can use the Q&A function on the uh, platform to ask questions. We will, as best we can, organize and synthesize those questions in the course uh, of the presentations. And after the speakers have finished speaking, we will have as full a, a Q&A session as time permits. Now, I would invite the first speaker, uh, Professor David Gwynne Morgan, to get us started. Thank you for that generous introduction. I can, after it, I can hardly wait to hear what I'm going to say. And I'd like to begin by thanking Rebecca and the Law Reform Commission for asking me to take part in what I'm sure will be a most interesting discussion. I start by talking about the um, the pre zelinsky landscape and how it's been changed uh, by this decision. And I should like to emphasize, I think, in line with what the chairman was saying first, that there are a lot of loose ends here. And probably part of the afternoon's discussion will be to try to see how we might we think that things might go. But I start with the, the pre lewinsky landscape and um, it, it was agreed on all sides, first of all, that the administration of justice is a very enigmatic animal and difficult to pin down. The, how, there was, however, some kind of a consensus around a list of four or five criteria which had been established in a, a case called MacDonald in 1965, which had in it in the list matters such as that there was a dispute as to the existence of legal rights and a final determination of them. And it was the fourth one which caused the, um, provided the nub in Zelinsky. And the fourth one is that the, uh, determination reached by the adjudicating body must be enforced by the body itself, as would be done by a court. And the issue here is that under the legislation, the uh, determination of the WRC would, if it were defied by the losing party, be enforced by the district court but the district court had very little discretion. And so the view of all seven judges, on this point they were unanimous, the view of all seven judges was 
that it, it, it was rather pedantic to uh, find that there was not an administration of justice because of the fact that the district court had some rather academic discretion left in the matter. So I think a fair way of characterizing that change, in effect taking out the fourth criterion, was to say that the, the question of the administration of justice, its meaning was a difficult problem. It had been solved unsatisfactorily in MacDonald, which had after all been the law for um, some period, since the period um, before many of the people listening to this seminar were born. And uh, it had been generally understood and applied therefore for 50 years. Now the Supreme Court has come along and said that the emperor has no clothes and has removed that uh, criterion. Now the, the, the second part of the um, duet as it were is article 37 and here the majority and the dissenting judges parted company because pre Zelensky the um, test of what is a limited function in article 37 had been whether had been the impact which the um, judgment of the tribunal was making on the individual. And um, in his majority judgment, O'Donnell at uh, 67 quotes the well-known statement which had been the law from Ray solicitors, which is to the effect that if the um, order of the tribunal is capable of having a far reaching effect on the person and fortune of the person affected, then it could not be limited. Instead of that, the majority judgment uh, brought up the idea that there could be quite a number of other factors apart from this, which could be taken into account, including the uh, question of whether there was an appeal and uh, a number of other factors which uh, are properly the um, meat of Laura later in the day. The point I wish to emphasize here is that the law had been accepted in the Ray solicitor's sense and this was quite a change. Now, where there is a change of this nature, and there were two changes here, then one would expect that the resulting law laid down will be better in some way than that there have been that, that the um, that there will be some improvement in the law, which is purchased at at the cost, admittedly, of quite a lot of dislocation. And my suggestion in the remainder of this um, contribution is that the changes which have been made or proposed or foreshadowed in the majority judgment with a fair amount of agreement from the dissentients on this point are ones which could have been reached without going to the lengths of the separation of powers, but using well-established principles of administrative law. Before coming to that, I'd like to say that we are dealing, when we're talking about tribunals, we're dealing with a very diverse uh, group of bodies, something which was um, mentioned in the chairman's opening remarks and will be considered later by Tricia when she goes into the question of which bodies are now not, uh, which are now within the scope of the um, widened um, definition of um, limit, which start again, they are um, 
administering justice because of the widening in scope which occurred, but they have been um, protected by being regarded as limited because that term too in Article 37 has been uh, widened. However, the big, um, the, the big feature of the majority judgment was to say that after um, establishing that there has been administration, the tribunal is administering justice, but is limited, the, the tribunals affected are to be regarded as, okay, to use the jargon, limited bodies, but they are to have these three um, major characteristics, which belong usually to a court, and that is that they are, there is to be independence, there is to be, uh, in principle, in general, a, he uh, a hearing in public, and thirdly, they are to follow certain well-known rules of um, fair procedure, such as allowing for cross-examination. And starting with the, the, the idea of independence, um, this didn't really arise on the facts of the case because as, as was the, the facts were that the adjudication officer had behaved somewhat unusually and had told the unsuccessful claimant that their uh, case was unsuccessful in the corridor. And, um, you know, this is in some ways an example of hard cases making bad law. This the relevance of this here is that that um, behavior, I would have thought, verged on misconduct. And one might say that uh, this was a question of control and to use an expression from another bit of the law, um, the servant being off on a frolic of their own. Uh, but certainly the um, O'Donnell's judgment at 147 went into the question of um, independence, saying that art, art, Article 137 bodies must be independent and without getting into the question or not by any means comprehensively of what that meant. We know that if you take the classic idea of judicial independence, then judges have to be, um, have to have life tenure, have to be a, um, immune from stringent criticism, uh, their salaries can't be affected, etc. How much of this applies to judges? Well, um, one thing, one negative thing which was said by O'Donnell at 138 was that um, these star chairpersons deciding decision makers of tribunals do not have to make a declaration under Article 34, 6, as judges do. Don't have to be appointed by the president and thirdly, uh, may have some other occupation apart from tribunal uh, membership. But that still leaves the question of what, uh, what, they, what, what do they have to do or not do? One might mention here that again, you have to be concerned about diversity. I think that for instance, if you take the members of the fitness to practice panel of the medical council, uh, they would be surprised if it was suggested that they were not as independent of the Minister for Health as district court judges are of the Minister for Justice. You have to look at all these things differently. And I'll come back to a, a more general comment in a moment, but I'd like to mention here one of the um, founding fathers of Irish administrative law, which was a case called McLaughlin and the Minister for Social Welfare, which arose when the appeals officer in what was then called the Department of Social Welfare had to decide whether uh, the um, member of the Attorney General's office 
who was before him, had to pay social welfare dues or not. This brought up the arcane question of whether this person was a civil servant of the state or a civil servant of the government, which I'm certainly not going into here. But the important point is that the appeals officer wrote to the Minister for Finance, wrote to the Department of Finance, asking for their ruling on the matter and then rubber stamped the, the reply which he received back. And O'Dawley Chief Justice at page 12 said that this was an abdication from his duty, which he's required to perform as between the parties appearing before him, as anyone who is called upon to decide matters of right and obligation. So there was no mention here of the judicial function or the separation of power. It was just uh, the matter was just decided on what I would call general principles of administrative law. Going back to the, um, the particular question here, there is a bit more detail than I mentioned earlier in um, the majority judgment at paragraph 147. And what the um, O'Donnell J seems to have had in mind is that the minister may revoke the appointments of an adjudication officer. I'm talking about the WRC, uh, but doesn't specify the circumstances. So the danger exists that these officers hold office at the pleasure of the minister. I would also say that the same kind of argument can be made about the appeals officer in what is now the Department of Employment and Social Welfare. I would suggest that th the law now is that these um, officials cannot be removed at pleasure. There must be a good reason for their dismissal. You can get that from the, the Garvey case on the removal of the commissioner of the guards. You can also get it from the strong principle which is running in public law at the moment that reasons have to be given. And I think it would be better to uh, use those principles than to bring in this far-reaching, uncharted um, oceans of the Article 37 body and the extent to which they have to pay, behave exactly like courts. I turn next. I turn next to the idea that the Article 37 bodies must sit in public, subject to legislation to the contrary. Again, there's a certain amount of law on this question of how far the legislation can go, but we know from decisions like R that this cannot be. This, there has to be a good reason for legislation which would change uh, the general principle that um, courts must sit in public. And now this has been extended to tr tribunals. Again, I think that this goes too far because don't forget that tribunals are rather different animals from courts. In the first place, we know from a Gilchrist decision that courts have common law powers to uh, sit in private. Tribunals presumably wouldn't. Courts also have powers to punish for contempt, which tribunals wouldn't have because they can't have powers in the criminal field. This is another aspect of Article 37. And there's quite a hinterland of contempt which could be used to discipline people who were sitting in uh, in in the court in it before sitting in a tribunal there isn't that history secondly uh, the idea of courts courts have been said to be administering public justice tribunals deal with a particular narrow section of the community and it may be more reasonable to expect a level of confidentiality here. The third and final point, which I want to 
uh, mention here is the emphasis which was put in the case on the entitlement to cross-examination, the administration of an oath, and if necessary, a perjury prosecution. We have, don't forget, a very well-developed um, field of constitutional justice, also known as fair procedures. In fact, probably there are more cases on this than anything else in public law. And I think that these um, certainly would have applied here. We know that there is a range of um, stringency with the courts at the highest level and some kind of privilege like the withdrawal of payroll from prisoner at the other end, the WRC would, at, would be at the court end. Uh, but this is well developed and there is no need for this new and probably disturbing concept of the Article 37 body to, to bring in this fair procedure idea, which has been there well established in law, in Irish law, since about the 1960s. Finally, um, I, I'd like having criticized the court to some extent to end with a confession uh, because it seems to me that the academic legal profession is, should be responsible not only for studying what the law is but for why it is and how it can be improved. And those of us, including myself for the past 40 years, I'm afraid, who've been teaching constitutional and administrative law have tended to teach the separation of powers in constitutional law, the golden um, number of three, the history, Montesque, the whole story, without linking it up with the administrative law principles which, are, which have been established and which generally speaking, are pushing in the same direction. Now, this case is valuable in that it does, to some extent, bring the two together. But I think that, I think that the, uh, as I've said, that the kind of improvement which was made in um, Zaninsky could have been made by a hefty dose of uh, judicial review. And to some extent, the fault with, lies with those of us who didn't make this linkage sufficiently uh, when we were teaching undergraduates. So if there are any academic um, uh, lecturers and academic lawyers listening, I hope that uh, they will do better than my generation in this respect. So uh, if you have been, thank you for listening. Um, thank you, David. Um, one immediate thought is that um, post Zaluski, there now perhaps is three categories where it might yes. seem to have been thought there were two categories of yes. endeavour, uh, adjudicative endeavour. The first are courts established as such under Article 34 of the Constitution, um, and perhaps everything else was previously considered to fall into non-court uh, adjudication yes. uh, with varying degrees of um, fair procedures, constitutional justice being required depending on the particular circumstances of the body. Now, as a result of the uh, decision in Zaluski, we have uh, a separate category of Article 37, non-judicial bodies who are administering justice within the limited confines of Article 37. Yes. Uh, as the majority judgment emphasized in very clear and powerful terms, they administer justice and the justice that they administer has to be to the same standard of just as the justice that is administered by Article 34 courts. So a challenge of Zaluski is to determine what are the additional 
requirements and demands that can be made of Article 37 tribunals that go above and beyond what is hitherto been the requirements of administrative law applicable to um, non-court bodies generally. And apart from the questions of independence and tenure, which are prompted directly by the discussions in the judgments in Zaluski, there are issues of representation, legal aid and so on, that may uh, arise differently uh, in the context of Article 37 bodies than they do arise, if they arise at all, in relation to um, administrative bodies more generally. But thank you very much, David. And um, now, Laura, um, thanks. Thank you, um, Commissioner Collins. And uh, I just want to echo my thanks as well to uh, Commissioner Collins and to Rebecca for organising this seminar. Um, there are really so many aspects of this judgment um, that are worthy of examination. And, and I think you could easily have 10 seminars on it. Um, it I think it's going to have major implications and it, it also raises many interesting questions. Um, but in, in the time given this evening, I, I'm going to try and focus on one specific aspect of the decision, um, which I think is important on a practical level, and certainly for the design of quasi judicial structures in the future. And that is um, on the question of the necessity of a merits based appeal mechanism from uh, decisions of quasi judicial bodies. Um, and Commissioner Collins has already summed up the the facts of the judgment essentially, but the, um, the the judgment or the decision finds that the procedures of the WRC are found to be an administration of justice contrary to Article 34. And then they're saved by the fact that they're found to come within Article 37's definition of a limited power. Um, and as David has noted, all seven judges agree that the WRC is administering justice. Um, and in fact, there is quite a lot um, that all judges do agree on, um, even though it might not be obviously um, apparent. But the minority judgments do differ on that limited finding under Article 37. Uh, now, Charlton's judgment is the one that focuses most attention on this issue of the lack of a, an appropriate appeal. Um, McMenamin is mainly concerned about what he calls the resolution of the case under Article 37, but he does also make some really interesting points on the appeal issue. Um, and McKechnie's judgment doesn't really go into detail on the appeal issue itself, but his judgment is mostly in line um, with that of McMenamin. Now, the majority judgment spends quite a lot of time analysing um, the history behind the Article 34 case law and, as we know, makes some very interesting findings on the administration of justice point. Um, and for what it's worth, I am inclined to agree with O'Donnell um, on the application of the McDonald principles. Um, when it comes to the issue of an appeal, um, McDonald seems to suggest, without much discussion, that the procedure under the 2015 Act is satisfactory and indeed is limited within the meaning of Article 37. And again, from my own perspective, that's where I, I, I have some difficulty with the majority judgment. Um, now, Charlton's judgment spends a lot more time on this and he finds that the process involved uh, violates the right to a justiciable controversy and also that the powers of the WRC couldn't possibly be considered limited given that a final determination is being made without any possibility of a de novo rehearing in a court. Now, O'Donnell then states his disagreement with that point, and he says he can't see how the provision of an appeal would bring what is obviously an administration of justice into an unconstitutionality. And he says, I've difficulty in agreeing that an adjudication loses its character as the administration of justice if the self same issue may be decided by a court on appeal, which is the administration of justice. Now he repeats this point a number of times and in answer to each of the minority judgments. Um, and certainly he has a point, it was accepted in Ray Solicitors that the mere existence of an appeal would not save what would otherwise be classified as an administration of justice. But I think 
and I may be wrong, um, that that seems to miss what the dissenting judges are actually saying about the existence of an appeal. Certainly, I don't think they were saying that a merits-based appeal alone would have rescued the WRC from an administration of justice finding. In fact, Charlton doesn't really focus on the issue of an appeal within that uh, administration of justice question under Article 34 at all. Rather, he seems to consider it under the remit of Article 37 and the definition of what is a limited power. And essentially his judgment states that access to a full appeal is a constitutional requirement. And this is where the, the 2015 Act has offended. He says the absence of an appeal means that the actions of the WRC can't be limited because they are an administration of justice, but without access to the courts. So there's no means uh, by which to vindicate rights where mistakes may have been made. So as I see it, the majority judgment seems to indicate that the minority equates the existence of an appeal with nullifying the administration of justice finding when actually it's more related to the finding of whether a power is limited. Now, the majority judgment seems to find that the existence or not of an appeal is not determinative when it comes to that question of whether or not a body is actually exercising administration of justice into Article 34. And that seems to be the main reason for the disagreement with the minority judgments. But the dissenting judges don't actually deal with that point, um, as far as I can see. Now, you can make an argument that the issue of an appeal is relevant on that Article 34 question, um, particularly now that O'Donnell has advocated for a more holistic approach rather than the box ticking exercises on the McDonald criteria. And because the question of an appeal is all bound up with the question of whether a body is making a final determination um, or alternatively, whether it's uh, involved in an, an enforcement procedure, but we don't have time to get into that today. What is interesting is that both the majority and minority judgments consider that the issue of availability of an appeal is a matter to be taken into account in deciding whether or not a quasi-judicial body's power can be considered to be exercising limited powers under Article 37. So there is agreement on that much. Um, in Charlton's judgment, he's clear that the power cannot be limited when there's no availability of a merits-based appeal to the courts. Um, in the majority then, uh, one of the reasons O'Donnell provides us to his finding that the power is limited, um, he states, is the fact of an appeal and judicial review by the High Court. So he feels that's one of the reasons why he can say that the power is limited because there is an appeal and there is judicial review. He says, the question of appeal or confirmation by the court has tended to be approached under the heading of enforceability. It's perhaps more relevant when considering the question of limitation of powers under Article 37. A requirement that a decision be confirmed by a court um, is necessarily a limitation on the powers of the body. However, as we know here, the appeal is only to the Labour Court, um, an appeal on a point of law to the High Court. So there's no possibility of a merits-based appeal under the 2015 structure. Of course, the High Court does retain its supervisory uh, jurisdiction. And earlier in the judgment, O'Donnell does mention how judicial review has become more searching over the decades since MacDonald, but he doesn't really comment on whether this is sufficient to displace a merits-based appeal. Although later on then, he does seem to suggest that it would be sufficient. Um, but Charlton is very strong on, um, in his judgment, that the availability of judicial review is no substitute for a full rehearing in an appeal. And he says at, at paragraph 53 of his judgment, what judicial review does not do and cannot ever do is remove a bad judicial decision and replace it with a fair hearing as to fact, leading to a correct factual analysis that vindicates rights and points to where the truth reposes. That is what Mr. Zalewski is entitled to under the Constitution. Now, if the Irish courts adopted a more flexible approach to the theory of jurisdiction, perhaps you could make more of an argument on the adequacy of judicial review as a potential remedy for errors. But even apart from the jurisdictional issue, as we know, there are, there are many significant differences. So 
while O'Donnell says the availability of an appeal makes the power limited, he doesn't actually assess the adequacy of the appeal structure in the case itself. He simply says that the correctness of the conclusion of the WRC on matters of fact or law may be reviewed and in so much as the decision made by the Labour Court is a matter of law, it's reviewable in turn by the High Court. And there's no further consideration of this apart from one comment on Charlton's conclusions where O'Donnell says at, at paragraph 119 that he sees no constitutional distinction between an appeal and the type of appeal and review which applies in this case, particularly when the review is um, of what is a limited administration of justice can be expected to be rigorous. Now, McMenamin is very critical of that. Um, so he says, OK, there's an appeal to the Labour Court, but the difficulty is this is not a court of law. It's a body appointed by the minister and the members do not enjoy the degree of independence which is guaranteed to the judiciary. He says this might lead to a want of appreciation of what's required as true independence. And then he also says judicial review is not a meaningful limitation. Now, it's clear the former process had potentially too many rehearings. It was cumbersome, it was expensive. Um, but this new process established arguably goes too far in the opposite direction. So the intention there to provide a relatively inexpensive, a speedy resolution to employment disputes, that is a noble one, um, but clearly that aim must not be pursued at the expense of fairness. And that's what the dissenting judges are very concerned about. Um, it's strange that uh, O'Donnell doesn't really engage with this point. Um, it seems pretty obvious that an appeal to the Labour Court is not going to equate with the judicial rehearing before the courts. However, while the judges differ on that issue of whether or not an appropriate appeal is actually in existence in this case, they all seem to be saying the same thing, that the existence of an appeal mm -hmm. is a determinative issue in considering whether or not a power is considered limited under Article 37. Now, in McMenamin's judgment, he's clearly very uncomfortable with what he calls the resolution of the case under Article 37, and his fear seems to be in relation to loosening the idea of what is limit, limited and the feeling that it creates a lot of uncertainty. And he spends a lot of time on this Article 37 issue, and I think quite successfully deconstructs um, O'Donnell's reasoning with regard to the five limitations actually mentioned in the majority judgment. Um, it's also worthy of note that var various academic authorities, including uh, Professor Morgan, um, were cited in the judgment who had expressed the view that in order to make sure that um, structures of quasi-judicial bodies would not fall foul of the constitution, that the existence of an appeal to the courts was a key issue. Um, so O'Donnell alludes to this in his judgment and then says that he, he cannot express any disagreement with that sentiment. Um, but later then he talks about how an appeal cannot save a patent um, unconstitutionality. And McMenamin deals with that point too. So he says prior to the 2015 act, a right to appeal to the court on the merits was, he says, it's clear assumed to be a potential constitutional um, protection. And it was adopted in order to avoid running foul of Article 34. And he says, this assumption can be easily shown. He quotes from the Keedy case and says, it was the fact that a court has made the final decision that was seen as providing the compliance with Article 34. And he says that in enacting the 2015 Act, the legislature departed from those protective measures. So he's clearly referring to the existence of an appeal as a protective measure. So where does this leave us then in considering how quasi-judicial structures should be designed into the future? And in particular on this issue of whether or not an appeal is actually necessary. Um, O'Donnell in the majority judgment notes that in recent years, the Oireachtas has strayed from that previous trend of including an appeal to the courts as a safeguard and that the structure created under the 2015 Act is at the other end of the spectrum in that the role of the courts is almost completely excluded. I think almost a vanishing point is the phrase he uses. Um, and it's understandable that the Oireachtas want to create 
a speedy expeditious system allowing for um, uncomplicated resolution of disputes uh, without having to have recourse to the courts, which can be expensive and time consuming. And this is something which is acknowledged in each of the judgments. But the question is whether that process is adequately protecting the rights of citizens. Now, the confusing part um, and what the, the decision doesn't clarify is whether the access to an appeal issue should be part of the Article 34 consideration uh, or the Article 37 question, or even is it an element of constitutional justice or is it a separate point re access to justice? And also what form the appeal should take. Does it have to be a merits based appeal to the courts or does the more limited form of appeal here suffice? Now, from a very practical perspective, whether appeal is an issue which is determinative under Article 34 or under Article 37 is of little import because it's clear that the existence of an appeal is in of itself a relevant matter. So in order to decide whether Zalewski has clarified this particular issue, I'm just going to finish with four questions, although there are, there are many more. Um, the first question is, is the existence of an appeal relevant to the question of whether a body is exercising powers of a limited nature, taking it within the definition of Article 37? And the answer to that is yes. So there's no ambiguity on that point, and at least we do have clarity on that. The second question, in order to come within that 37 definition of limited, must there be a merits-based appeal to a court? Now, this one is unclear because the majority decision seems to indicate that the limited form of appeal provided under the 2015 Act is sufficient but the minority opinions dissent so strongly on this point. Um, and if you read the language of those dissenting um, opinions, um, even McMenamin says he, he is, you know, using very formal judicial language, but, you know, it's quite clear that they do feel very strongly about it. Um, and also the fact that the majority decision didn't really address that question of the adequacy of the appeal itself, um, that does complicate uh, the decision on that point. But another question it raises is if a merits based appeal is necessary, then what is the purpose of it? And that's also a question which hasn't really been satisfactorily dealt with. Um, the majority judgment doesn't engage with the issue. Um, Charlton's judgment sees it as an issue of vindicating constitutional rights. Uh, so it is likely that that issue will have to be revisited. And then finally, what is the appropriate approach into the future in designing quasi-judicial structures on the question of whether um, to provide a merits-based appeal to the courts? Um, and that's the key question. On the one hand, the majority judgment seems to have given the seal of approval to the structure designed under the 2015 Act involving an appeal to the Labour Court, appeal on point of law to the High Court, and obviously the availability of judicial review. But Given the strength of the dissenting judgments on this issue, uh, we really can't say that that is clear. Um, and there's also lots of murkiness at times on that very issue in the majority judgment itself. So unfortunately, we really don't have clarity on that point. And so it seems that the wise or at least the cautious thing to do for those designing structures into the future would be to go back to that previous practice of ensuring that the findings of these bodies are in the nature of a decision rather than of a final determination with the possibility that they can be overturned uh, on appeal to the courts. But it seems that we will have to await further clarification um, in what seems to be an inevitable future case uh, on these questions. Thanks, Laura. Um, I just observed that I suppose you're right to say firstly that there is there was consensus uh, across the court about the relevance of the existence of an appeal uh, at least within the confines of article 37 because mr justice o'donnell in his majority judgment uh, identifies as a as a factor not a decisive factor necessarily but as a, a material factor the availability in the first instance of an appeal from the wrc to the labor court and then an onward appeal uh, on a point of law to the high court. Um, 
I suppose uh, one, one of the odd things about the way that administrative law has developed in Ireland is, is that, and this is observed by Mr. Justice Ronald by reference to some observations of Mr. Justice Simons in the High Court um, at paragraph 23 of his judgment, that it seems somewhat anomalous that as the MacDonald and Borden Agon test came to be applied over the years to determine whether an administrative body was ad administering justice, a great attention came to be paid on whether the order made by the body was self-executing or whether it required um, effectively uh, confirmation from the court. And confirmation from the court or the requirement for it came to be seen as a, a protection against characterizing um, administrative tribunals as bodies engaged in the administration of justice. And that explains the difference between the High Court and the Supreme Court on this, that the High Court took the view that the um, confirmatory function of the district court, attenuated as it was, was sufficient to uh, justify the not ticking that box in the five box uh, menu from McDonald and Conroy and uh, sorry, McDonald and Borden Agon, and all of the Supreme Court disagreed with that. Um, a, a pattern in Irish administrative law or Irish statutory law in relation to administrative bodies has been that over the years, confirmatory functions have been narrowed in many cases, as in the um, WRC Act itself, while simultaneously appeals to courts have been narrowed and appeals that were previously available on the merits have been removed and become appeals on points of law. And that's not just in the area of um, employment law. Uh, it applies equally in respect of income tax. There used to, income tax, there used, used to be an appeal from the appeal commissioners uh, to the circuit court by way of rehearing, and that's been abolished by the, um, the recent uh, Tax Appeals Commission Act. So um, some element, what I think distinguishes the position of the majority and minority is that um, some element of merits-based review must be present to um, protect against the, or to protect the functions of an administrative body. Whether that is a confirmatory jurisdiction that isn't, that is more than what Mr. Justice O'Donnell characterized the confirmatory jurisdiction here at fig leaf, um, whether that is sufficient to bring it outside Article 34, or whether it is an appeal which uh, brings it within the scope of Article 37. Uh, I suppose remains to be seen whether it really whether those different confirmatory or review functions operate differently one by reference to article 34 and one by reference to article 37 but the view of the minority was that there has to be a judicial merits based review whether by way of confirmation or whether by way of appeal and that is that was the point of difference with the majority because the majority view was that the appeal provisions that were uh, present, merits-based appeal to the Labour Court, appeal by way of on point of law to the High Court, was sufficient in conjunction with the other features identified um, by uh, Mr. Justice O'Donnell at 116 and 117 of these judgment were sufficient to enable the functions to be characterized as new. But as you say, there's much to be uh, debated and worked out. Um, now, thank you very much, Laura. Um, now, uh, Tricia, um, thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you, Rebecca and everybody at the Law Reform Commission for um, inviting me to take part in this con conversation. And also thank you, David and Laura for, for giving um, such delicious food for thought in, in relation to um, the decision um, on, on a fascinating and, and, and academic plane. I suppose what I've been asked to do is um, bring something 
quite practical and um, given what has been said, quite um, ambitious to the table is to identify which bodies might be considered to be Article 37 bodies. Um, and if they're so categorized, well, what difference does it make to them in, in, in their procedures and, and their day-to-day -day lives? So which bodies first? Um, I'm going to go first for the absolute lowest hanging fruit in this, which are um, those bodies which were identified by the Supreme Court in Zalewski as being part of the established jurisprudence of, of Article 37 bodies, and those are onboard planola and property arbitrators. Going beyond that, one has to give a um, an analysis of the, the flexible application of the criteria in McDonald and then the limitation um, or the broad um, definition of limitation under Article 37 that has been brought about by Zalewski. So my first candidate for being an Article 37 body other than the WRC is the Residential Tenancies Board. And the reason that I think that the Residential Tenancies Board is um, a prime candidate for being an Article 37 body is because it's engaged in resolving disputes between landlords and tenants. So that's a dispute over legal rights. It makes final determinations which are subject to appeals from its adjudicators to its tenancy tribunal, from the tenancy tribunal to the High Court on a point of law. Um, its decisions may be enforced or converted into orders of the district court on a review. And finally, it's um, historically, a landlord and tenant has historically been the domain of the courts um, and currently remains within the courts in, in, the, in the commercial context. It's limited for the purposes of Article 37 in the Zalewski um, um, definition because it's limited by its subject matter, the quantum of damages and uh, th that it can it can give, the remedies that it it can um, it, it can fashion are also limited by the statute, and it has a limitation of the ability to enforce its own decisions, and it's also subject to judicial review. So that's my first candidate for being an Article Thirty Seven body. Now I'm going to go on to a trickier proposition um, next, which which is much more arguable. And I, 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 by, by putting this forward, I hope to, to, to show that, that um, the test, as, as Laura has mentioned, is that, that there's great in, in clarity and, and questions um, remain to be, to be worked out um, through this. So the trickier proposition is the committee which hears appeals um, from board of management of schools to expel or suspend a child um, from the school under section 29 of the Education Act. Now, that body is of course um, dealing with a dispute and um, the entitlement of the child to attend the school or the entitlement of the school to suspend the child. The determination of the appeals body is, is final. It's enforced by way of the um, appeal, um, the appeals finding being rendered a direction given by the Secretary General of the Department to the Board of, of Management. So therefore conscripting the executive, not the court, but the executive. Um, and, um, and as a matter of history, well, it's definitely not something that the courts were involved in. In fact, if you look at the old case law and suspension and, ex and expulsion, the courts would have said that suspension of a child is within the magisterium of what um, a, a head teacher um, may, be, may be entitled to, to do. Um, however, if one looks at that it, through the Zalewski lens, one has to ask, well, is this the kind of thing that the court might be 
asked to do? Is it the kind of thing that one could imagine um, the Oireachtas requiring a court to do by, by, by way of a statute, say a district court or a circuit court, um, engaging in the review of the, of the local schools within its area of the, of the suspensions that, that, that there may be? And, and that's where you have huge arguments as to where, whether it should be the matter of the courts, it's a constitutional question of a child's education, or whether it, it's simply something that, that that's uh, outside its jurisdiction. Is it a limited jurisdiction? Is it a limited administration of justice? Well, the subject matter is limited, the remedies are limited, the um, enforcement um, has to go through the Secretary General. It's not subject to appeal, but there it is a, an eminently um, review, reviewable under, under judicial review. So that's one I'm putting in my maybe pile. Um, that which is not an administration of justice under, under Article 37, I'm going to, to, to look back to prior um, case law of the Supreme Court on this. So um, sports bodies disciplinary functions remain outside of the, of the um, Article 37 jurisdiction in my view, and the authority for that proposition, which I don't think is dislodged by Zaluski, is O'Connell and, and Lamb versus the Turf Club, um, which was a, a case of the Turf Club exercising its um, statutory powers to discipline a, a jockey and a trainer by revoking their license, which meant that they couldn't engage in, in, in their pro profession. Now, it was held in that case that because the removal of, of the license um, couldn't be converted into a, a judgment, um, that it lacked the enforcement limb of McDonnell, and also that sport and the regulation of sport was not uh, a subject matter the courts um, involved themselves in historically. And I would suggest that it, that remains the case that courts would be reluctant to um, interfere in the in the workings of the disciplinary aspect of, of, of what sporting bodies at, at least did. However, one f dicta that that um, I think is significant that that, that came from um, uh, from the turf club case and which was reiterated in um, Zaluski is, uh, is that it is too late for a comprehensive theory um, to, de to develop a co comprehensive theory between bodies which are required to act judicially and those e exercising judicial functions. And that was what Mr. Justice O'Donnell said in the Turf Club case. And he reiterated um, in Zaluski that there's no infallible litmus, te litmus test to determine whether a body is um, one that's acting judicially or one which is an Article 37 body. So with that in mind, I'll give up trying for the time being and move on to the second part of my question, which is, well, what difference does it make if a, if a body is categorized as a th Article 37 body or a body which is required to, um, to act judicially? And Commissioner Collins has already set out the fundamental components of, um, uh, or the headlines at least of, of what Mr. Justice O'Donnell stated were required for a, a body which was involved in the administration of justice, albeit in the limited sense of the, of the Article 37 jurisdiction. And they were the independence, the impartiality, the, dis the dispassionate application of law, openness, and fairness. And it's worth pointing out that Mr. Justice O'Donnell in Zaluski said, look, those also can apply to a body that is acting judicially. The difference is that the bodies that fall under the Article 37 jurisdiction now have a structure of analysis being, is it that the standard of justice, which is being extrapolated in, in, in those bodies, um, it, that cannot be lower or less demanding than in a court. Yet at the same time, Mr. Justice O'Donnell, for the majority, I said that 
informality remains a valued aspect of, of those cases. So while informality is permissible, the um, standard of justice must be analogous to that which you would expect in, in a court. So what is required and what is not required in an Article 37 body? And the first thing that I should point out is not required is for the decision maker to have a legal qualification. Um, that, that was rejected as a procedural flaw um, within the Workplace Relations Commission. And, and what that effectively means is that specialist tribunals who, uh, whose decision makers are specialists from their fields can still be set up, established and work without um, their decision makers being, being lawyers. However, those decision makers must apply procedures which are the analog of what, would expect, what, what one would expect in terms of due process in the courts. And that leads to a very practical issue. Well, how, how, do you, how do you do that? It's not, of course, impossible for people who, who are not lawyers to, um, to learn the law and the, and the statutory provisions in particular in the specialist area that they're involved in. But due process, which, I, which of course you can also teach people about, is larger than the than, than the regulatory environment which they may be involved in, in themselves. Due process isn't necessarily an intuitive thing. Understanding one's jurisdiction isn't necessarily an intuitive thing. I'll give an example of that. A, a specialist decision maker who, who isn't a lawyer might intuitively believe that it is um, fair and reasonable to accede to a request on the consent of both parties to enlarge their jurisdiction for the convenience of the parties. But that's not permissible under, under the rules of jurisdiction and, and you, you, you simply can't do that. And so what I suggest is the implication of, um, of saying that um, people who are not lawyers can work as decision makers in these specialist areas is that um, training and quality assurance in those in, in, in the decision making function must be um, supplied and maintained and, and, and topped up. Um, but when I talk of quality control, of course, that leads you into the next thing which is required um, of Article 37 bodies under Zalewski, which is the requirement for enhanced um, independence of the decision makers. And of course, David has already spoken of this, of this somewhat. Um, and it should be noted that in the um, Workplace Relations Commission, the, the adjudicators, the, the, the 2015 Act requires that the adjudicators are independent in their functions, which is a, which is a common um, formulation that, uh, across a number of quasi-judicial bodies. The critiques of the independence in Zalewski were that those um, decision makers first could be um, re removed with no stated reason. And um, secondly, and that the uh, adjudicators could be civil servants subject to the direction of the department and, and the minister themselves. So when Zalewski talks about enhanced independence, which is required of Article 37 decision makers, um, what it brings to mind, um, to, to my mind at least, is that the terms of, of appointment and the terms of recruitment and selection um, would have to be at a remove from the, from the minister and any um, prospect of discipline and in particular of removal um, would have to similarly be, be um, robust and not impinge on, um, on independence. So on a day-to-day -day level, does that impinge on the, on the independence or can you have a quality assurance process within um, quasi-judicial bodies that, that doesn't impinge on, on, the, on their independence? And I'd um, proffer up the IPAT example in, in this regard. Um, what IPAT do with their decision makers is after 
um, the decisions have issued, a certain selection of them will be taken up for review uh, along due process matrices. So have they been giving, uh, given adequate um, reasons? Were they timely? And there's a peer review system whereby those elements can be can can be discussed and noted, and that um, and that improvements can, can be made and quality can, can be given. Now, I think a robust system like that, which um, doesn't necessarily allow for removal but can allow for improvement, might bridge that gap between a specialist decision maker not being legally qualified, but the adjustments for quality control purposes being being put in place. The next procedural requirement of um, Zalewski was um, that cross-examination had to be available and where there's a serious and direct conflict of fact, there had to be the possibility of that evidence being taken, taken on oath or affirmation. And of, of course, uh, as David has mentioned, the availability of, of cross-examination um, has been something which is required in quasi-judicial contexts um, for, for a long time. Um, from the case of Kylie and the Minister for, for Social Welfare, it's clear, clear that tribunals um, who are acting judicially, not Article 37 ones, are entitled to act informally. They can act on hearsay evidence, but not if such would imperil a fair hearing or a fair result. So to that degree, there isn't a great amount of difference in terms of the availability of cross-examination. The administration of the oath is, however, for many um, um, quasi-judicial bodies, if they were to be categorised as an Article 37 body, um, a, a, rather, a rather new thing and would introduce formality where it hadn't been there before. Of course, the oath is designed to bring formality and gravitas to the proceedings and to, and to bring out um, the truth um, in, in the matter. Now, I wouldn't necessarily say though that the administration of the of the oath um, deprives a body altogether of, of its informality. I think in the adoption authority adoption hearings, the oath is administered, but the tone of the hearing can remain quite informal and quite inclusive. And it's simply look, we're, 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 we're administering the oath because this is a serious matter and, and every, all parties would, would agree that that was the case. I think my concern about the attachment to, um, to Article 34 via Article 37 of, of such bodies to cross-examination and the administration of the oath is the tendency which that will almost necessarily lead to, um, to, to make such proceedings more adversarial when a huge amount of, of, of these cases, the WRC, um, the RTB, and many other are set up to have an inquisitorial role. So the duty to inquire in the RTB and the uh, and the uh, and the RT and the WRC is something which, to my mind, avails in particular unrepresented parties who, who might not know which evidence to bring forward in those inquisitorial questions, bring out those, those, those areas, that, that, that factual matrix, which has to be covered in order that the decision maker has the information upon which they can, they can make a, a, a reasoned decision. Um, I'd also point out that the inquisitorial role is not necessarily inconsistent with the judicial approach. Judges take on an inquisitorial um, approach when they're dealing, for example, in childcare cases. Um, and I think that, an, that, um, that there is a possibility of having a hybrid of an inquisitorial approach, which also allows for cross-examination without taking away from um, and the largely inquisitorial um, aspect of, of the case. But I think, again, that's going to be a matter of skill and training of the of the decision make makers. I think the largest um, of the uh, of the areas where there's going to be sea change for for um, for 
um, Article 37 bodies is the finding or the linkage of the of the public hearing um, to such bodies, in particular those which which hadn't um, which hadn't allowed for it previously. And David has has already set out the rationale behind that, um, and the fact that the exceptions to um, open justice must be justified. Um, I would point out a couple of of, of aspects um, here. Um, in terms of the RTB adjudicators who are bound up in um, duties of confidentiality, of course, they, they, they can't just simply render their, their, their hearings public. There would have to be a statutory change. But one of the things that can occur in those private adjudications uh, in the RTB is um, the development of the, of the conciliar the powers of conciliation, which are which are all pro also provided for within the adjudicator's function, and I'd suggest that perhaps that might work better in a more private or, or closeted function. However, um, where one is looking at the um, possibility of openness and transparency, um, and in particular the Zalewski, um, um dynamic of the of the serious errors which may occur if there isn't scrutiny, I should also mention that um, it's quite um, even in those even in those quasi judicial bodies which, who, which have their hearings in public, it's extremely unusual. For the public to 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 observe, it, um, I think I've I've been involved in around two hundred of them, around four of which had any observers whatsoever. So the reality of that scrutiny is is something which I would question. Um, it has been suggested that in um, in the UK that that remote hearings gives a. a, a a great boon to transparency, but that boon can be limited by um, obviously access to technology, but also access to um, to the lists, what's on where, and that could be a factor in why no, nobody turned up to the hearings that I, that I was involved in that were that were that were public hearings. Um, but but I think that um, in that regard, it's worth noting that. Um, Many, if not most, quasi-judicial bodies now ha um, are designated under Section 31 of the 2020 um, Civil Law and Criminal Law Miscellaneous Provisions Act to hold their hearings remotely by default. And so, therefore, they should technically be able to allow for greater access to their hearings should that, should that be required. Um, so, finally, I I, I conclude saying, by saying that there are certain elements which I think are, are very adaptable within, within the quasi-judicial landscape to, towards um, Article 37. Um, quality assurance, um, however, where, where um, decision makers are, are, are not lawyers and indeed where they are lawyers, is something which which needs to which needs to 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 to, to, to have some focus, and I, I would agree with the comments already made, and that um, that that perhaps what we're really looking at here is is if you have an administration of justice, which is being in fact administered by people who are not lawyers, perhaps we do need to have some legal oversight somewhere, and perhaps that's the route the route to that is legal aid. Thanks indeed, Patricia. Um, before uh, going to the questions, we have quite a number of questions. Um, I would just make one point, I suppose. It, it, there is a very wide spectrum of administrative bodies doing very different things in very different ways. Um, and it's sometimes easy to think that just because their decisions uh, perhaps are all uh, susceptible to judicial review and end up in court uh, from time to time by way of judicial review of their determinations, that they somehow uh, are a coherent set of bodies doing much the same thing. Um, and that's kind of looking through the telescope the wrong way, I think, in a very serious way. But having said that, 
if you want to try and identify the number of bodies that really do exercise functions very similar to the functions exercised by the WRC in the Labour Court under the WRC Act, they are few and far between. Uh, the Residential Tenancies Board is, certainly would seem to be one. Um, the Financial Services and Pensions Ombudsman in respect of financial services, at least possibly in respect of pensions, um, does has functions which uh, could arguably readily be performed by a court. Of course, they're given to them precisely to provide an alternative to the court. Um, that's the whole raison d'etre of the Ombudsman system, at least in, in this jurisdiction. Uh, so the number of, if one takes then as the starting point, uh, you take the WRC structure as a paradigmatic Article 37 structure, um, then the number of tribunals that come close to it, uh, or come close to that structure is probably quite limited. And uh, that doesn't mean necessarily that the number of bodies coming within Article 37 or that have to come within Article 37 is, is limited, but certainly the um, close analogues are limited in number. Um, now, a number of questions have been asked and uh, I'm not going to identify the questioners um, and I'm going to try and um, as best I can uh, group them by reference to uh, themes and, and one of those is I suppose article 34 the, the article 34 issues and one question um, asks whether uh, it's fair to suggest that Mr Justice O'Donnell um, had uh, has discarded the McDon McDonald test as um, it is suggested Mr Justice McMenamin suggested um, and it's the question asks whether, in fact, he has strengthened the test by rendering the history limb uh, applicable only to protect those matters that have been historically dealt with by the courts, so that it would not operate as a shield against novel matters being seen as business of the courts. And that's the discussion in Mr. Justice O'Donnell's judgment uh, concerning, I think, the fourth of, of the limbs in, in MacDonald. So, um, would any of you care to comment on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I I think what O'Donnell is doing on the McDonald principles is bringing it actually back to the case law of pre um, McDonald and closer in line with what Chief Justice Kennedy suggested in, in the Lynham case and. Um, I think O'Donnell's reasoning is very persuasive on that, actually, and particularly on the on the historical point. I think he he reasoned through that very well, and I think the point being made by the questioner is that is that not now making the test better um, in in sort of reanalyzing particularly that historical limb, and I think it it does actually make the test better, and I think the fact that the test had been reduced to a box ticking exercise. Um, possibly wasn't very appropriate and certainly taking that more kind of holistic approach to it looking at the issue of administration of justice as a whole rather than saying oh well if any specific one of these things is missing then it can't be classified as an administration of justice I certainly think that is an improvement. Certainly uh, it's important I think to make it clear that um, article 37 and article sorry Article 34 of the 1937 Constitution doesn't freeze the jurisdiction, the protected jurisdiction of the core of the courts at, at their 1937 levels are only in respect of their 1937 functions. And I think in answer to the question, I think that is certainly a, a valuable emphasis in the majority judgment that uh, certainly Article 34 protects against the um, removal of existing jurisdiction from courts, but doesn't in any sense permit new jurisdictions to be created and allocated to non-Article 34 courts to be determined. It may or may not do so, depending on the nature of the functions, but it doesn't a priori exclude newly created jurisdictions from the 
um, scope of Article 34 itself. Um, then there are a, a number of questions concerning uh, the possibility of n new tribunals being created to uh, deal with additional functions, whether that has been made more difficult as a result of the Zalewski decision. And uh, in, in particular, um, there a question has been asked as to whether future tribunals could be created now uh, to deal with important but uh, arguably limited issues such as a, a constitutional rights tribunal or a human rights tribunal. And I, I don't think we can have a, a constitutional rights tribunal, uh, certainly, but uh, perhaps, Patricia, would you like to comment on to what extent can um, does Zalewski prohibit or, or, or permit um, the creation of new jurisdictions and vesting those new jurisdictions in tribunals and um, supposedly on the basis that they are limited even though they may be uh, important functions and matters no i i think that the point that that um that you raised a few moments ago feeds will feed into that and the point that the the laura um highlighted as well in terms of of, of looking at the the um, historical approach to the reasoning behind um, Article 37, which was um, to, to permit um, certain very far-reaching far um, um, bodies to persist in, in their adjudications, and they included um, the, the, the Land Commission, social welfare adjudicators, etc. And the, what, one of the points of the flexibility um, imposed on the um, McDonald's test was, as you say, to, to prevent that crystallization of new bodies at a historical moment, which may which may have may have now passed, and um, one of the questions that uh, Mr. Justice o O'Donnell posed in Zalewski was, um, would you would you have been surprised if the if the workload of the WRC had been had been put on a court rather WRC, and if it is, then um, if you if you wouldn't be surprised, then then it, it falls into um, into the um, the administration of justice. But then, when you're looking at the limited um, capacity, well, I think the limited test is extremely broad. It's it's to be limited on the basis of um, subject matter or remedies or quantum. So I think that you're, you're, you're I, don't, I can't see how constitutional rights could be in, in any way limited because constitutional rights are, are huge, but some element of a constitutional right, well, of course, the, the right to work, the right to, to, to housing are already in um, what I consider to be Article 37 bodies. So I wouldn't have thought that there's anything which would prohibit further bodies being created in in that regard by Zalewski. Thanks. Um, David, I have a question uh, specifically for you, um, which is uh, touches on an issue that you've all spoken about, which is the question of um, independence and the requirement for independence in respect of Article 37 bodies. And this questioner says that, um, that he they are a manager in a quasi-judicial system and uh, suggests that independence from minister or government is really a, a theoretical concern only, uh, and whereas quality standards of decision-making is a huge, pressing, real and everyday threat to fairness, giving management the power to terminate, not renew contracts of pure quality, poor quality decision-makers is one of the few meaningful tools available and there have been several other questions concerning tenure and independence, uh, some specifically by reference to w WRC and others more generally. Do you want to just try and uh, address that general question of independence versus, uh, as Tricia described it, quality assurance within adjudicative bodies? How, how can they be reconciled? Uh, 
I think it's a very large problem to reconcile independence with discipline. It arises, of course, in regard to judges too. And we, we know that in connection with the, um, the system of disciplining judges, which took about 20 years to be established. Um, getting, and it, it also was glaringly present in the facts of the Zanuski case because, the, um, because of the way the adjudic adjudications officer behaved there. Um, how, how you, how you, um, rec how you design a system to allow for um, adjudication, uh, to allow for discipline without compromising. I, I suppose you, br you bring in outsiders. Uh, you obviously have to give the, um, the um, decision maker uh, lots of constitutional justice. Uh, and um, you, you have presumably to have some kind of a, a code which would make it clear, let us say, the extent to which external misbehavior um, was, um, could be the, the subject of a misconduct charge or whether it was confined to the um, performance on the, on, the, on the job itself. Uh, this, but it is, it, it, it is, of course, it, it, it also gets a bit to the, um, the question of security of tenure and the question of how long the contract of the um, decision maker is, because the usual, I think that this was in the question, wasn't it, but the usual um, solution where you have a, a um, a decision maker who is substandard is just not to reappoint them after three years. Um, equally, one doesn't want that to be used as a, a lever for excluding somebody who is competent but independent. Uh, sure. Um, that's clearly an issue. Can I, just, can I just add one thing which I, I should have mentioned earlier? This, this talk about the um, having tribunals at the standard of a court. One might ask, which court? Is that the district court or the high court? And secondly, and this is something which perhaps I should have brought up, I, I am a bit concerned about the extent to which, even if, if one takes the view that the decision maker doesn't have to be a lawyer, it seems to me you're going to increase the number of legal advisors for instance, as there is on the Medical Fitness to Practice Committee. And if you increase that, that kind of person, then you're going to possibly reduce the influence of the experts, the, the non-law experts who are deciding on matters of competence or ethics. Because the legal advisor is always going to be saying, be careful what you do because there may be a judicial review. If the if the um, person being disciplined is right, their rights are possibly trespassed upon. On the other hand, you have the interest of um, patients or clients, and there's no cons there's no pressure in the other direction. So that's what you get if you lawyerize the process. And what I'm saying there takes one back to the advantages which what it, it was considered tribunals had over courts and the reason why they were historically established. And I think that, and this is something for your, um, your work for the Law Reform Commission, one doesn't want to see too much lawyerization of these processes at the cost of genuine expertise and experience being influential. Sure, and uh, that um, raises another issue, which is, of course, that in many tribunals, both at first instance, but perhaps particularly appeal tri tribunals, um, members are specifically selected and statutory provisions make provision for the selection of members who, have, who are involved in a particular 
segment of activity or industry and who are intended to bring to bear a certain amount of experience and um, expertise within a particular area of activity. For example, um, aquaculture licensing is just an example. Um, the regulation of estate agents, the appeal bodies, uh, the body provi provisions provide for uh, estate agents to be appointed inter alia to uh, the appeal body that governs licensing and so on. Um, are they expected to be independent in quite the same way as a judge who is expected to be um, disinterested in an adjudication before him? And more broadly, I, think that's major, I think that's a major problem. And as you know, the um, Medical Practice Act was altered to provide that on any panel, there should be, I think, only one doctor leaving uh, the the um, second aspect of that is that expertise in medical ethics has to be fed in by expert witnesses rather than coming largely, as was the case before, from members of the panel, which might seem to a layperson to be the obvious way to, to do it. And then getting back to another point we've been talking about, the lack of independence and the danger <coughs> that the doctor on the panel or more than one doctor will have too much sympathy with the doctors and not enough sympathy with the with the patients that's that is taken care of in my my opinion by or could be taken care of by institutional bias or some type of bias and you you know the first rule of um the constitutional justice um against bias um, and these these are these are things which which sometimes are not considered um, as 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 much as they should be because certain assumptions are made. And another another one is the the danger that if the if a person is not represented, let us say, before an appeals officer in the Department of Employment and uh, a, a, a social, um, a social security, what, whatever the correct title is these days, um, the the appeals officer may be afraid to ask pertinent questions because that may give the impression of bias against the uh, claimant, with the result that the claimant does, isn't able to make their case. I think you mentioned the question of, <coughs> excuse me, of the question of uh, legal aid. Uh, when that is necessary to for a case to be properly put. One could get into the question, should these tribunals have powers of discovery? Should they have rules of procedure? Where is it going to stop? Sure, sure. And of course, the Labour Court itself and the EAT before it, um, exercising powers in the employment law sphere, are examples or were examples of that form of uh, thinking behind the composition of the body, where there was a representative of the employer side, a representative of the employee side, and an independent chairperson in the EAT, uh, a qualified lawyer, not the case in the Labour Court. But Laura, can I ask you one question that follows on from that, which and it follows from a question uh, raised by one of the um, attendees. Um, to broaden the question slightly, the question asks whether it would be a good idea to follow the example of other jurisdictions to create some form of unified um, tribunal system uh, where with a perhaps a mixture of generalists and specialists or lay people and uh, non-lay people uh, as a way of perhaps uh, ensuring high quality decision making. Um, and can I just broaden the question slightly by asking whether uh, is there a role quite apart from the possibility of creating some such uniform general a tribunal of general jurisdiction, a role for supervision of tribunals by a, a body like the Ombudsman or a council on tribunals that sought to uh, lay down procedural standards that would be followed by all tribunals, as opposed to the current position now, which is uh, 
that in a sense uh, tribunals have to each make their own rules each make their own procedures subject to the particular statutory regime within which they have to operate and this is clearly an issue that the commission will be looking at as part of its project so you have any thoughts on that yeah, that's a really interesting one. I mean, the idea of creating a sort of standardized or uniform system, um, of course, would probably require a constitutional amendment uh, to, to get you to, to that point. Um, not, 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 not necessarily. I suppose it depends on, in England, uh, the, 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 tribunal, the upper tribunal in England has the status of the High Court and appeals from it go to the Court of Appeal, and that certainly could not happen in Ireland without a constitutional amendment. But you could have, it, I suppose, a, a tribunal of general jurisdiction created by statute, um, subject to it all, all of its jurisdiction fitting within Article 37, of course, uh, it, to the extent that it was administering justice. Sorry, I've interrupted you. No, 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 that, that's, I suppose, is, is the key point there. And um, I suppose two issues, that, and I'll come back to the, the idea about the ombudsman exercising a supervisory jurisdiction, because I think that's a really interesting one, but on the idea of, of creating, um, you know, some sort of a, a standardised tribunal and, and on the question of its jurisdiction, I think one thing that a problem that Zalewski has created is we don't actually know now what is the definition of limited um, under Article 37, because as David Good Morgan says, if you're if, if you're going to depart from precedent on something, you should be creating something and you know an improvement and, and making things easier. But I don't think the decision makes the definition of Article 37 any easier. I think it has made it more murky because we're moving away from that phrase, which wasn't particularly helpful in race solicitors, but wasn't a nice phrase about the far-reaching effect. And now we don't really know what limited means. So I think that. That is one major problem, but I think your idea about having a supervisory jurisdiction um, exercised by something like the Ombudsman would be a major improvement in terms of process and in terms of the level of, of citizens engaged with it, because as you say, it would allow for standardization of procedures, which, and that I think is a main message coming out of Zalewski as well, in that the judges were all very critical of, um, the procedures and it sounds like there was evidence given of like systemic problems uh, within the WRC process itself and obviously those are things that will have to be tackled and something like a supervisory jurisdiction um, I think would be a really useful way to do that. Patricia, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, well I, I suppose the first thought I, I, I would have is um, while a standardization of, of, of approach would be very welcome from the point of view of analysis and and a particular re review in in the courts um albeit um it's very difficult to discern the reason why various bodies were set up as adjudications and various bodies were ombudsmen of various bodies were were um were, were tribunals or or whatever um the, the, the fact is those those bodies were set up for, with a particular cohort in mind and um, it may be that a standardization um, has to in fact um, first do the taxonomy that that you were talking about first and say well which bodies have similar characteristics and so therefore would avail of similar um, procedures amongst them rather than having one set of procedures which would which would cover cover all and in, in that regard I think that it's actually quite a salutary tale from from the only provision that that I know under, under statute which covers all um, or could cover um, all or the majority of quasi judicial bodies which is the this one in the 2020 act which creates the default position for um, quasi judicial bodies who have been designated to have their to have their hearings heard on a remote platform, and so their default now is not to have in person hearings unless there's an application on the on the on the basis of unfairness or or it being contrary to the interest of justice. But if that goes across the board, then it, it frankly makes no sense. Whereas it may well make sense to um, to say um, 
the adoption authority in times of pandemic, it go, first it goes beyond the times of pandemic. And secondly, it doesn't um, work so well at all, even in times of pandemic for mental health tribunals where, where having an in-person hearing is, is, is really um, something that, that, that has, to, has to get back going as, as soon as possible. If, um, and I know that steps are being made towards that. So uh, I, 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 yes, procedural standardization is, is required, but I think it's got to be a very careful exercise looking at why the attributes of various um, quasi-judicial bodies were set up in, in particular ways and whether they work or not for, for, for the parties that appear before them. Yes, and it raises big issues, I think, about whether the model of adjudication is really quasi-judicial, impartial adjudication, or whether an important part of it is expertise in subject matter expertise in the decision makers, um, so that, for example, the expertise of the members of the Tax Appeals Commission is, is very different to the expertise of the um, decision makers in the Social Welfare Appeals Tribunal and so on. Um, in any event, I think, I think we have, um, Rebecca, in substance, gone through most of the issues that have been raised by questions, I think. I think we have. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, um, thank you all very much for your uh, attendance and your um, endurance. Uh, the commission and the project that I've mentioned, the non-court adjudicative bodies and the appeals courts project, it's still at um, a relatively early stage. We're seeking to scope out our, our way forward. And I think apart from anything else, and, and the webinar today has done lots of other things, it, it demonstrates just how vast is the area and territory covered by the project. Um, we do, we will want to engage further with the public and with the legal community as we go forward. Hopefully this is the start of, uh, of, a, of an engagement that will continue. Um, details of the project are available on the website. Uh, we will also, I think, Rebecca, post details of how the recording of today's webinar can be accessed. Um, and uh, I think there's nothing more for me to do but to Thank everybody for attending, but particularly to thank um, Professor Morgan, Dr. Kahalan, and Tricia Sri Skeffington BL for their very, very interesting contributions. And um, thank you again, Rebecca, for organizing the webinar. And um, thank you, everybody who asked the question. And hopefully, we have uh, succeeded in perhaps not in throwing light on many of the issues that arise from Zelewski, but at least identifying some pathways of further inquiry that may lead to wisdom in due course. Um, thank you all very much. Bye-bye. Um,